Hello and welcome to Wise Women, the Vicar and the Witch. I'm Maggie Whitehouse and I'm the Vicar. And I'm Susie Crockford and I'm the Witch. We are perceived perhaps as being on opposite ends of a spectrum, but we're friends and we see the common threads of our different experience of the sacred. So please join us as we discuss life, the universe and everything. So we're aware, I'm aware, that I keep rampaging on about how um, we are all to blame and we must sort it all out and then we're not really giving any tools other than go and go and not buy plastic. <laughs> um, and so today I would really like to focus on our various methods of making sure that we do transmute and not transmit Absolutely. our pain. Absolutely. And- I am still a beginner at that, but I can certainly share what clumsy efforts I've made that do work. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to go first, then? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so it's basically, this episode is about techniques that we know of through experience that have worked to transmute our pain. Yeah. Which means we hopefully do not transmit it in the future. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. Okay, well, the first one is do not reply to any email that is not desperately important for 24 hours. <laughs> okay because you will read it wrong the yeah, amount of times an email comes in or a message comes in I've had a situation with a friend of mine who was upset with me because I was supporting her through some trauma and I have a pattern of withdrawing after that I need to get my space back I need to get my smell back because when I'm being supporting of somebody it's not that I'd say that they're right. It's it's supporting of exactly where they are. Mm-hmm. And quite often I don't understand their viewpoint. Okay. But it's not my place in certain situations. When there is a discussion to be had, that's fine. But in, when somebody's going through trauma, you have to help them be where they are. Yeah. But sometimes I, well, I have a pattern, and I hadn't realised this pattern until she pointed it out to me, of pulling away after that. Once the trauma is over and it's resolved... Then I'll go off into my little cave yeah, and probably won't be very much in touch with that person for a while. And this has always happened with men and they've never minded it. Yeah. But with the lady, she did mind it and she felt abandoned, which is understandable. Yeah. Um, and she was wanting to talk it through. And it was interesting talking it through with her because I still couldn't understand her talking through I couldn't understand it at all so I had to actually go away and say what's going on in me about this Mm -hmm. and until I worked out what was going on in me about it and where I felt confident and strong in me and where there were weak spots in me I couldn't answer her Mm. does that make sense yeah it makes perfect sense Mm. yeah I I think that's really really true is that we uh project onto many of the transmissions that we receive from other people Mm. a whole bunch of stuff which is completely unintentional yeah well i stopped i was wouldn't read her messages for 24 hours because i was afraid of them Mm. and then when i read them i sort of possibly reacted so then i had to go back a, a day later and read it again from a different perspective and of course, it was always fine when you did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even if it wasn't what was written, it, and this is a wider example, of, it's not just this one relationship. Mm. Quite often, you go back and read it the next day, you'll read it from a different part of you, and you go, oh, that wasn't as bad as I read the first time, because you projected your stuff onto it. Totally. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, and just being aware that you do that is so important. Yes. Well, and I think it's really important to, to be aware that you do that and to re-examine letters, emails, conversations, Mm. relationships in the light of a question, did I project all kinds of stuff into Mm. this? And if I did, what was it? And where did it come from? Yes. Because that, that, statement we so often make especially in the what do you call it woo woo shitty bollocks <laughs> stuff wanky bollocks. wanky bollocks um uh we always have this thing of you know we co-create our reality of course we do mm. yes we do and on in any moment the stories that we tell ourselves are the glasses through which we look yes and the those glasses can get 
pretty fucking steamed up mm. and with, grubby and grubby without us even noticing mm. and all of a sudden we are in experiencing seeing a version of reality which is so not the reality of the other participants in that particular act of the play as mm. it were yes as to just get everything really 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 wrong yeah and if we can keep doing that thing of just take a minute take mm. a minute mm. before we um before we respond rather than going straight for react yes is very it's a very good idea yes. it's not always possible frankly no, no but it's a good idea but as is the 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 action i don't know is it an action yes it's totally an action of reflection even as a practice, reflection at the end of the day. How did I do? What did I do? Not in, from a, a way of judging necessarily, although I guess in any practice like that, there is some form of sort of self-judgment mm. mm. is going to be implicit, but not to make the self-judgment not self-condemnation, but an apprenticeship always to the idea that tomorrow I will attempt to be better. Self-discerning. Self-discerning, yeah. 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 And that the more we are reflective on our day, our responses, how we've been, what we felt, what happened, mm -hmm. the more possibility we give to ourselves to open the doors and windows, if you like, on what have I projected into my life what ways in what ways am I what was your that statement you made last time that the the last thing you said in our last oh podcast if you don't was, transmute your pain you will transmit, transmit it. it exactly what are the ways in which I am transmitting my pain yeah. and how can I then transmute that pain yes and to know when we're doing it to me is mm. step one Know when you're doing it. Know when you're in projection rather than in clear sightedness. And you can't do it immediately. You can only spot it later to yeah. start with. And in my experience, you spot it later, you make a resolution, and then you forget and you do it again. Yeah. And then you forget and you do it again. And then you notice just after you've done it. Yes. And then you notice while you're doing it, but you still do it. Yeah. And then you notice and manage to stop. Yes. And that can take a year. Yes. Yeah, I describe the very same process <laughs> <laughs> frequently to people. Yeah. And, it, and it, each it is... stage of that is really good. Yes. Yes. Just noticing it to start with is huge. Massive. And in fact, to me, noticing it is the biggest part of it and yeah. the hardest part of it yeah. is seeing. Yeah. I behaved appallingly at my Auntie Beryl's funeral. I behaved exactly the way I hated my mother behaving. Oh dear. And that was the wake-up call that was the beginning of working through one transmuting what was going on between my mother and me, because she was transmitting her pain. Mm. And she started transmitting her pain to me when my father died. Mm -hmm. She transmitted it to him before. Right. And I was the next nearest thing. Yeah. Um, but what I did at the funeral was, was, oh, it was utterly ghastly, and I didn't mean to do it. My mouth opened and it came out. Oops. But basically, my uh, goddaughter, who was Auntie Beryl's uh, granddaughter, wanted to speak. She was 12. So I went up with her and actually wrapped my coat around her, lovely big coat, while she was speaking. So she knew she was being held. Yeah. And she did so well. She was amazing. Tell this wonderful story about how Auntie Beryl always cut up sandwiches with scissors. Which, what a brilliant idea. Totally genius. <laughs> Absolutely utter genius. I cut lots of things up with Sam with that because of that. No, and it's marvellous. Anyway, and afterwards, a distant cousin came up and said to me, I thought your daughter spoke really well at the funeral. That was marvellous. And I said, she's not my daughter. If she were my daughter, she wouldn't speak with an accent like that. <gasps> oh, I know. Lucky. I know. I mean, I have no defence for it. And I had no defence the moment it came out of my mouth either. I was utterly gobsmacked, but that was exactly what my mother would have said. Exactly. <laughs> so that was the biggest first moment of going, shit. Yeah. Everything I hate is me. This is going to take a long time to unravel. 
and I'm afraid it did. <laughs> because I had to look at every... When I remembered, which I didn't, every yeah. snarky remark, every women can't do that, every your sister-in-law is marvellous and you don't cook, you, you know, every your dad is dirty, everything of that had to be... I had to try and remember to go, where do I do that? Yeah. Or where do I want to do that? Because I now know that I can and I do. And just like I said about having children, no, this stops here. Mm. This stops here. I, I have been given a, the gift of extra life having been ill mm. to stop it. Yeah. And I'm not there yet, but I'm walking in that direction. Mm. Do you project stuff, from, pick up stuff from your mother? Um, do the same as you. I mean, you're much. I certainly different. have. Yeah. Um, I do remember, not entirely jokingly at all, as I can't remember if I was a teenager or a young woman, but you know, pretty much almost with total sincerity, saying to my brother, "If I'm ever like her," pointing to my mother, "Please kill me," and you know, in me really. Mm. quite meaning it in yeah. the moment and the more I got into my stuff as it were in inverted commas with my mum the more firstly I ended up having a huge amount of compassion for her mm. because exactly as you described in our last conversation what she was handing out was only a response to what had been handed to her. And she was handing out a softer ball. And she was handing out a softer ball. Mm. She had an incredibly... I mean, she, she comes from a truly lovely family, but she had quite a scary and miserable childhood mm. in a lot of ways, not from her family, but from her schooling. Mm. Really, really, really unhappy mm. at school, which was clearly vile and horrible. Yeah. And is a trauma. And, and is a, huge a tra trauma. massive trauma, yeah. And a, a prison, an is inescapable trauma. Indeed. And probably even though she had a reasonable relationship with her parents, I don't know, she couldn't tell them about that. They couldn't help no, her with it. No, they didn't seem to even no. hear her. And my Auntie Beryl was an absolute darling and gorgeous, but my cousin could not tell her because it would upset her because they saved up money to send them into this nice school. And it was a school where if he was disobedient, they made him kneel on chalk in bare knees. Bloody hell. Never told his mother that. No. I never told my parents about things I got punished for at school. And one doesn't know why you can't tell them. You can't trust them with it. You think they're going to blame you too or something. I don't know. But this kind of stuff that comes from school is incredibly rude. Mm. Yeah, my school was, well, deeply weird because I was... I went to a boys' school, and I'm clearly a girl, and have always been a girl. And my, I was allowed to go there because my dad was the head teacher, mm. and he made a made a thing where the people who taught at that school were allowed to educate their children at that school, no matter what sex they mm. were. And when I first went there, there was me and one other girl. I mean, yeah. what a totally bizarre position to yeah. be put in, both in when I went to, to I started off in a perfectly normal primary school for a year, which was actually also horrible, but for whole other reasons. There was this bully who really picked on me and my brother, and she used to get us by the hair and bang our heads together. Oof. But, um, uh, anyway, well, you yes, can't so really at that point go, she's just transmitting her own thing. no. <laughs> Well, no, what was weird and awful was about it was that, I mean, she was clearly a young person who was in significant pain, but she was the one who, I can't remember what, but she had some physical things that made her different. So I can't remember if she had more or fewer fingers than the rest of us. Right. And more or fewer toes, I can't remember. But it wasn't, you know, she could run around the playground mm. like everyone else yeah. and, and she wasn't super disabled or anything. Yeah. But there was a kind of, there was a thing in the playground that Ellen could be as horrible as she liked to you yeah. because she had to put up with whatever it was, I can't mm. remember, extra yeah. or fewer. And that none of us ever told on her because no. there was this kind of, was that a girls' school? No, it was mixed. It was mixed, was it? Interesting. Yes, well, 
I don't know if that happens anymore, but I remember my ex-husband, there was a girl in our class who was Jewish and she didn't go to assembly, so she got to read through our homework books while we were in assembly. She often didn't do her own homework. And my, and my husband, who was Jewish, sort of said, oh, so you got anti-Semitic then? And I said, no, we envied her. Yeah. We never sneaked on her, we just envied her. We thought it must be great to be Jewish and be able to sit <laughs> Yeah, I mean, children can be I vile, it. but also... I'd have done it. <laughs> yeah. God. I think... Uh, the thing also about, tell, for God's sake, tell me if I get like that. My father told me that my mother had said to him, if I ever get like my mother, for God's sake, tell me. And then he said, but you know, the thing is, as soon as she did, I couldn't. Oh. And that's so sad, isn't it, for both sides? So sad. But I could never tell her she was like Granny either. You just couldn't do it. Because the rage that would have come out. Yeah. Yeah. And then the self-pity that would have come out because she was just like Granny who would not have transmuted it. No. Yeah. Although maybe a little softer than Granny by the sounds of it. Oh, a great better than Granny. A great bit better than Granny. But Granny had her own pain, obviously. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah. Well, so, you know, back round to how do we transmute our pain and not transmit it and not, you know... I reckon, even if you had the most perfect apple pie mum, I, mm. I don't know many women, although I do know some, who genuinely would look at their mum and go, I want to be just like you. Mm. Because we are, each of us, as the generations roll over, there's going to be things about our mum which are always a bit behind the times kind yeah. of thing in terms of our our evolution yeah. as much as anything else into hopefully more conscious, more aware, more mm. generous, more able yeah. to respond rather than react, etc., etc., etc. beings. But that I, th I obviously can't speak about what it's like to be a man not wanting to emulate his father, but to, to be a woman not wanting to emulate your mother. For me, there was so much juice in that, both around a big journey of understanding and compassion around understanding why maybe she did some of the things she did or sort of thought mm. some of the things that she thought yeah. or said some of the things that she said. And then a big journey around, uh, around seeing my own projections onto her. Yeah. And that to, to me, that was the biggest one. That was the gobsmacking one. Yeah. To realise that it was my version of events that made what she was saying or doing so ugly yes. not hers got it spot on yeah. absolutely and one of the things i have to do in the next months is watch where i try to attract the same behavior as my mum would sometimes offer me because yes because now she's not there now there's that great space yes. so i've got to do a lot of transmuting and yeah. a lot of work to do to make sure I don't recreate. Indeed. Which is what the ego will want to do. You was you know, you you were happy having this little quiet secret enemy of your mother. Gosh, yes. Well spotted, Maggie. Oh, no, that's that's why I'm talking about I'm in liminal space right now. I really am. It's yeah. a huge amount to be done in it. And uh, hopefully go God Gaia mother will help. I'm <laughs> sure yeah. she they will he it will. It, she, it, <laughs> I'm sure you will. Yes. You looking up. I'm sure you will help. But the secret is to know that I have to do that. Yes. Because I was 50% of the issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If not yeah. more. Yeah. Frankly. Exactly. Um, one thing, uh, another absolutely, ad I'd say adorable thing that happened on her last day was she'd always been very snotty about the internet, talking about your thing about they're not as up with it. She wouldn't have anything. She was evil. It was this. It was that. It was the other. But I told her about Tchaikovsky's Hymn of the Cherubim, which I think I've mentioned before, and mm -hmm. how beautiful it is. And she just suddenly said, have you got that hymn that you told me about? Mm -hmm. So I got it on YouTube and played it into her ear. And she just lay back. That was the second last piece of music she ever heard. Oh, and she said, "I never thought I'd live to say I'm grateful for the internet." <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
fantastic. Sweet. Yeah. And then she started talking about loving the 16, you know, the ancient singers of old music. So I found their version of, of Allegra's Miserere. I can't pronounce it. It's one of those words you can't stop saying. Miserere. Miserere. Miserere, thank you. Says the not, <laughs> the not religious one. <laughs> By the 16, and it's about 20 minutes long, and I just played it for her on my mobile phone. Thank God the battery last, lasted because it was close. But So it was so lovely to be able to utilise something that she'd hated to mm. bring her peace on the last day. It was lovely. But, of course, in, in the un... I mean, I am not enlightened. Do not think for one moment I am enlightened. But the completely unawake me could have gone the other way and say, well, you don't like the internet, so I'm not playing it to you. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are so many ways in which we can just be vilely childish. Yeah. Even as old women. Yes. <laughs> and that, that you know, as any as everything, maybe this is, perhaps this is what I'm, when I'm old, I'm going to have become so dull because that all the time I'm just going to be saying it's your responsibility, it's your yes. responsibility. But that it, it is, you know, the, the, the fastest, least painful, most obvious way to get to the place where we don't become our own mother or don't be what we didn't want to be or and and don't live in a world that is full of agonies for us mm. is to examine exactly that. Examine what are the ways that I am projecting this out or calling it in. Yes. And that examination of our lives examination of who we are and why we think what we think and indeed what we do think mm. is incredibly important and there i think we're especially in these times of kind of less sociability even i know that you know it's it's we're in the what people are calling the post lockdown world mm. and all the rest of it but you know we've had lockdown and if my experience and of most of the people I know is anything to go by. I'm still not seeing as many people mm. or going to as many kind of mm. social things as I used to, which means that my opportunities to say stuff out loud are still curtailed. Mm. And I know it's true for me and for plenty of the people that I know, and therefore it must be true for more than just us is that sometimes we don't know what we think until we get to say it out loud. Oh, I frequently don't, as you pointed out to me many times. <laughs> yes, it, when you say it, you hear yourself going and say, actually, I don't know that I do believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so the opportunity to have conversations, really, really heartful and truthful mm -hmm. conversations with somebody that you love and trust and yeah. that you know loves and trusts you. Yeah. Well, this podcast is in many ways responsible for the improvement of my relationship with my brother. Because I haven't spoken to very many people very much, as much apart from teaching, and that's a different uh, discipline. But he and I have been talking more and more because mum had to go and live in a retirement home because of all this. Mm. And we've started to become really good friends, and I know his astrology, so I, I can watch him stepping from different aspects of his chart, which is really interesting. And because I've been not talking to so many people, I've been talking to... Oh, sorry, not better quality people, but people like who know, have this kind of knowledge, mm. like you. Every three weeks, we have a couple of hours together talking like this, which was my major social event. Yeah, yeah, it was just too. by Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so uh, since I've been talking to my brother since lockdown, I've been talking much more as me. Yeah. And even though he's atheistic uh, and totally anti-religion, I've just started coming out with stuff because it's me. Yeah, and he's responding to it so it's actually been really good for us but the only reason it's really good for us is I've stepped up and started being more me yeah fantastic in the family. yes yeah. which is another deeply weird one isn't it yes I mean I know there are loads of people who will totally relate to the idea that you can't be me in your family yes who the hell else are you going to be yes and and how much of my family doesn't approve of me yes is my projection, ho yes. hum, you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, my brother's always said I was bad with money. That's because I don't own a house because I sold a house to go to Montana with my ex-husband and, and lost the lot. So, okay, very logical uh, assumption that I'm bad with money. But, in mm. fact, I did sit him down and have lunch with him a little while after Montana, and I took him through the whole process, all my thought processes and what the pressures were and what the, this, that and the other. And at the end of it, he, he had listened and he was really respectful. 
and it wasn't until mother died that he even mentioned anything about money again but he did go back into that old thing of i don't want you to waste the inheritance mm. you know if you're going to waste the inheritance i'm going to clamp down on it to which the answer is fuck off you can't <laughs> yes. um, was not expressed to him in those terms i'm sure but it was the old pattern that came out and i somehow walked into it and found myself feeling a bit knocked by it yeah but it's just a pattern yeah 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 it's his way of saying he cares for me and wants me not to be feeling insecure yeah there is that but i would never have yeah. seen that before but now i can see that because he's so lovely i yeah. adore my brother now yeah. i love talking to him and i also notice that he talks to me in a way on my own that he never speaks to me in in, in with the family uh -huh. never with his wife or son which and of course we always were meeting in family. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that also says, perhaps, that he has projections around what they would make of and your I think conversations. He's right. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, fair. I think he has been made quite clear yeah. what they thought about. But do you know what, though? I mean, isn't it, isn't it weird that in our families, I'm trying this out on my tongue. Yeah, so good. I'm, oh, I'm, I love that phrase. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> oh, that, um. I think they're the only people, are they? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to try it out. I think they're the only people for whom we are willing to pretend to be someone else. But maybe that's wrong because maybe a lot of people are willing to go and pretend to be someone else when they're at work. But you should die. Well, oh, I think this comes back to the Gabor Mate stuff on it. It's something I really wanted to get into this episode, so thank you. Quite off because we have to attach to our parents mm. emotionally as children because we're so helpful, helpless. <laughs> well, there's a Freudian slip. <laughs> we actually have to blank out some of the bad bits, mm -hmm. so we don't even know that the stuff that's affecting us is there. Yeah, and I've lost my point. What were we talking about? We're talking about why we pretend to be other than we, we pretend really to be are. other than we are because that's the behavior that gets the love from the parents, okay. And we need that love, so we will actually suppress who we actually are to behave in a way that gets rewards. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens a lot in families. It happens a lot at work, and it happens a lot at school as well. But we, we seem to live in a kind of society which encourages you to fit in and not to be yourself, which is why what, when we do individuate, we do it so clumsily. But so that is... I see that you are almost certainly correct what i don't understand is i don't need to be correct no all right then well that you've nailed it that you've expressed what is in a way that i understand um <coughs> what i don't get is isn't it in your family that you're supposed to find i can't think of the word the the um the love that isn't predicated on some kind of exchange. Unconditional. Isn't yeah. it in your family you're supposed to find unconditional love? Yes, and I think you do if you're in, in, in an indigenous culture of families who are not primarily traumatised. <coughs> we are in a culture now where every single person has some trauma. I would have thought that so are indigenous cultures, personally. Yes, but different but... trauma, as in survival trauma. Well, and the trauma of being surrounded by us a lot, too. Well, yes, well, I was going back a bit further than that, but yes, right. yes, you're right. Okay. Uh, we are... We are traumatised, we are all wounded, but most of the time we don't know that we're wounded, so we're transmitting that. But I, I know that I unconditionally love my sons. They, there's nothing that they could do that would stop me from loving them. Mm. I would, there are things that they could do that make, would make me abhor their behaviour, potentially, yeah. but I couldn't not love them. I don't think my mother would have possibly stopped loving my poor me. I don't think mother... I think it's most unusual that a mother doesn't go on mm. loving. It's just that the the ego has to try and correct the other's behaviour so that it's more respectable or something. I, I don't know that you can love while trying to correct. I'd, so I I'm, I'm not a mother, so I can't. No, I know. Okay, so yeah. I'm trying to stand in the middle here of being yeah. both a daughter and a mother yeah. because I think that's a really interesting viewpoint. So if I look at my mother, I see it's absolutely true, and my father, that there are ways in which I have simply not presented the real me to them mm. because my story is that the real me would be unacceptable to them, yes. which I suspect I have 
quite possibly evidence to suggest that that's the case if I go back through my yeah. life. And yet, when I look at my children, I can't think of anything more painful to me in some ways, in within the context of our relationship, than that they should feel they have to be someone else to find my approval. Yeah, now, is you. that because the times have changed, or is that because actually, as child, I have projected onto my parents a story about them not loving and approve of me, approving of me for who I really am? I think both of those are probably true, and I'm going to risk throwing something else into the mix. Mm. You have three boys. Mm. It might have been very different with the daughter. Possibly. I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Either. I don't know. But the more I talk to other women, this thing which some people call the mother wound, which I don't quite understand what it is, is quite often, and my mum's dear friend Fel, who's a substitute daughter, we've had so many wonderful sessions talking about how she loved my mother because my mother was the mother she didn't have. Mm-hmm. And I love my auntie Maureen because she's the mother I couldn't have. So it's um, there seems to be a pattern, and a totally understandable one, of the mother, certainly in these last years, really, really hard that the daughter has so much freedom, more freedom than she did. Okay. So my understanding of the mother womb is... Su wound. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just threw it out because it's a phrase I know, but I don't know what the actual... Th thing is gone okay well pretty much that really that that the mother wound's got something to do with feeling terrible pain over precisely that not being loved and approved of by your mother and having a sense that uh that in some way you are condemned, as it were, by the very person who should love you the most or and, yes. and approve of you, and that this is this is a kind of unhealable wound in us. I really don't know about it. Mm. Well, we'll perhaps we'll have a look, at, uh, find out more about it. But, but I I know that was my pattern, and I know that was my uh, Fell's pattern. And we talked about the fact that the boys never did anything wrong, even if they did do things wrong. They were allowed to do it. Their opinion mattered. And time after time, my mother would ask me for advice and then ask my brother and take it. Mm -hmm. and yes. Usually it was the same advice, but it would be his advice that worked. And there was a, in her case, there was a kind of, you may not be at all poppy because I couldn't. And that's totally unconscious in her. But she was a fabulous writer, a beautiful singer, gorgeous soprano voice, and a good actress. And none of those happened. Mm-hmm. Whereas I get to lead choirs in churches, badly, because my voice is cracked, but I've got books published, I was a journalist, I met famous people, I've travelled the world more than her. How hard must that be for her to see? I remember once she said to me, you're just so bloody independent. And the answer was, well, I had to be your agoraphobic mom, I had to do it for myself. I individuated too early. Do you, I mean, I don't, I get, I totally get what you just said. Yeah. But, but would that be hard for her or would she be absolutely thrilled at how you were able to do what she was not? It was hard for her. Okay. It was only acknowledged as good in how it reflected on her. Whoa. Okay. So that was basic narcissism, actually. Mm. And again, it wasn't her fault. She'd got a lot of Leo in her chart. She had a difficult childhood. But once I spotted it, it was easier. But it also made me more secretive. Mm -hmm. Because there was no point in telling her something that she could not celebrate for me. Yeah, fair. But also knowing her astrology was useful. She had a lot of Germany and uh, Lion, my husband's father, had a lot of Germany too. And Germany must inform people. They must spread the news. It, they want to be first with the news. It's, well, in the way that Germany was placed in both their charts, it was like that anyway. Yeah. So when we we were married four times, we were first married when God woke us up in the middle of the night and went wallop, which I won't go into. And then the second time in the synagogue in Cordoba, where it was you have work to do together. And the third time, we said our marriage vows in just to each other at, Worcester, at Gloucester Cathedral. And then the fifth, fourth time, we went to a register office and made it legal. Mm -hmm. But we did that just with two friends who were witnesses. And my lion's father was coming up to visit his grandmother's grave, and my mother was 
coming round for tea. So we invited them both round for tea and said to, and told them we got married. And they went, oh, can we tell people? And that was our wedding gift to them, that they could go and tell everybody that <laughs> their <laughs> children had finally got married. <laughs> So that was a, a win-win for everybody because we didn't want to have to go around and tell everybody because it was a third marriage for me and a second one for him. So that was using the astrology beautifully to give them the pleasure of it. <laughs> but there were many other times in my life when uh, she'd say something like, well, I had to go to hospital yesterday. And I said, yes, I know. Well, how do you know? Michael told me. Oh, I see. Because she had to be the one with the information. Yeah. Yeah. And that was her wound. Obviously, she wasn't listened to as a child. Yeah, fair. So to go to go back to it's our responsibility to yeah. talk to sort this out in in ourselves. We are the ones who are here now. Yes. So we are the ones who've got the power to stop this tangled web of yeah. projection and yeah. suffering and not telling all the truth and well, all the Well my suggestion of it. would be look at everything you hate, including the Taliban. Mm-hmm and certain presidents, former presidents of the USA, or or the anti-vax folk, or the pharmaceutical companies, or the government, or anything, and find out, work out exactly what it is that you really object to in them, and where is it in you? Yes. Where have you behaved in exactly that way, or where have you wished you had the power to do that? Because if you can find that in yourself, you have opened the door to spiritual growth in a big way. Yeah. And it is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It Everything really is a mirror, is ultimately. Yeah. It's, it'll, yeah, not necessarily directly. Yes. But everything. Yeah. And if you don't transmute it, even when they've gone, you'll continue the run. You'll continue that pain. Mm. So for me, the, the, the work is to go to the spirits and to say, to, to do a shamanic journey and to go and ask the question. So one of my favourite questions is, is in regard to me and me wanting to be the very best version of myself I can possibly be. Mm. What am I not seeing? Yes. <laughs> yes. Or what? where would it most benefit me to put my attention? Mm. Um, where, how can I let go of such and such a mm. story which I know is total and utter projection. Yeah. Um, because sometimes it's really, really hard, isn't it? Even though we know, mm. oh, I projected that. Oh, it's incredibly hard. Yeah. But oh, it's, it's to, simple, but to it's not easy. To let go of the stories, yeah. yeah. To let go of the stories and to understand that everyone is just another iteration of the divine, yeah. no more or less perfect than you or I, and that they're all just trying to. And so, especially when it's stories of, you know, you wounded me, you hurt me, you blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little story to close, if mm -hmm. I may, on my own intolerance. A lot of people say that whenever they see a white feather, it's a signal from an angel. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's a feather that a bird lost. <laughs> you know, so, so I, I got into that to start with, and then I realised, okay... I'm noticing the feathers, so it's me that's the thing. The feathers are still there. Mm. And then I started getting snotty about people going, oh, it's a signal from an angel, because you didn't see them actually picking it up and running with it. What is the signal from the angel? Oh, it's a signal that I'm loved. Yes, you are loved, but if it is a signal, it's a sign of something. And I've learnt very much that whenever I see a white feather now, I'm being intolerant. Oh! So that's my signal from the angels. Great. I'm judging people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but without actually going into it, without realising that I was the one being snotty about this. Yeah. So, uh, but so what I actually do is it's very similar to you, except I don't go into, into the drumming, though I'm going to get into that more. Bishop taught me how to drum. What a great <laughs> bishop. Um, is I just say, what does it mean? Whenever I see something, I just say, why are you showing me that? What do I need to learn from this? And if I see just something, a bit of litter on the ground, or so, some, sometimes it's just pick up the litter, Maggie. Mm -hmm. It can be that simple. But yeah, yeah, yeah. other times it's, what is the significance of this? Okay, I don't know, I'm going to sit with it, will you show me? And something always comes through. Yeah. And it's always, oh, shit. <laughs> well, no, actually, sometimes it's, oh, thank you. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit's I mean, thank you. potentially, 
everything is an omen. Everything yes. is an omen, mm. but it's just up to us to yes. decide that we're ready to unpick whichever, yes, whatever it is. Yes. Are we running out of time? We're desperately out of time. Oh, dear. 39 minutes. But, oh, okay. We'll be but right how now. lovely we've been having these really rolling conversations on deep stuff. Yes. Do you think we've given enough solutions for one? I hope so. I hope so. So if you hate it outside you, somewhere it's in you. Because ultimately we can't see anything but ourselves. Everything in us is, everything we see is part of us. Because, because we are part of everything. Because we are part of everything, yes. So everything that comes to us is part of us and we are part of it. So, and, 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 bye, bye.